Good evening. My name is Barbara Watson, and I am the longtime president of the Historical Society. Not exactly by choice, but you know, that, that's what happens too. But uh, we are going to have a night at the museum tonight. And this is going to be a very special night, and some of you I know have been to Miss Nora's performances before, and if you've ever been before, you want to make every opportunity to come back. But of course, there's a little bit of housekeeping you always have to do, uh, and I always hate to say anything about bathrooms, uh, ladies' room, men's room, because as soon as you say that, sometimes that, you know, sort of puts thoughts in people's heads. <laughs> uh, but we have to do that. The restrooms are down the hall here, uh, and uh, the men's and the ladies are on the same back hall there. And I'll also tell you where the doors are in case of an emergency. We have three exits out. Of course, we have the front doors. We have a side door out there. And then we have two, actually, two back doors back here. But most, I don't know whether both of the back doors are open, but we, we, do, we do have another way to get out. But uh, a night at the museum, we are presenting, returning, by popular demand, Nora Brooks, and she is going to be Mildred Child Lee. Does everybody know who Mildred Child Lee is? You didn't read about her in your history books, probably. But she is the daughter of General Robert E. Lee. And we are so glad you came tonight because not only is it a special night, we are going to be very much entertained, but this is also a fundraiser for the museum. And uh, because I've said that, I would like to introduce the uh, interim director here at the museum. Some of you have not met her. I think most of you have, but maybe someone has not. And that uh, Cindy Day is our interim director. And she is doing a fantastic job. And as soon as I get this microphone unplugged, we will invite Mildred Child Lee to come out on our stage tonight and tell us all about her famous father. Well, good evening. How very kind of you to invite me here this evening. I have looked so forward to coming back to North Carolina. Papa thought so highly of his North Carolina troops and so I have come back tonight to uh, be your guest and to share with you some stories about Papa. Let me to introduce myself. My name is Mildred Child Lee. I am the youngest daughter of Robert Edward Lee. You all uh, know him most fondly as the general, of course. To me, he was Papa, and to the students at Washington College, he was the president in the last five years of his life. And he would be so embarrassed if he knew what I was about to do. He was such an humble man, and he would be so embarrassed. But of course, he is my very favorite thing in all the world to talk about. And so I'm going to share with you, and I shall begin at the beginning of Papa's life, of course. Now, he was born in Virginia, and my Papa's father was none other than Life Horse Harry Lee. He was a great Revolutionary War hero and a dear friend of General George Washington. And my grandfather Lee gave the eulogy at General Washington's funeral. First in war, first in peace first in the hearts of his countrymen, that's what he said. Now my father's mother was the lovely Anne Hill Carter. The Carters of Shirley Plantation, a beautiful brick mansion on the banks of the James River near Petersburg. And my grandfather had come there, I, I confess he came there in hopes of courting a, a bride. You see, he had originally married the divine Matilda Lee of Stratford Hall on the Potomac River. But she had recently passed away, leaving him with a small family. And he came there to court one of the Carter cousins. <laughs> but uh, she was not receptive to his advances. <laughs> my grandfather Lee had quite the reputation with the ladies. <laughs> uh, and although my grandfather Carter was not convinced that this was a suitable match for his lovely daughter, my mother, a grandmother had been swept off her feet by this handsome colonel come calling. He was also the governor of Virginia at the time. 
And so uh, the courtship proceeded, and since papas can't tell their daughters no for very long, uh, they became engaged. Now, she immediately tested her engagement ring on a pane of glass in the parlor there at Shirley, and I'm very happy to report the ring passed with flying colors. Her initials are still on that pane of glass to this very day. And they were married in that very same parlor before they returned to Stratford Hall. And of course then their babies began to come. Now Papa was the fourth born of five. He was the youngest boy. And he was born on a very cold and icy January day. January the 19th it was, in the year of our Lord, 1807. My grandmother was very ill. She had recently returned from uh, a visit with her parents there at Shirley, returned in an open carriage in the middle of January. And they feared that she would not survive the delivery, but she did rally her strength, and she named this new arrival herself after her two favorite brothers, Robert and Edward. Now, <clears throat> it is frequently the uh, Papa's responsibility for naming new arrivals, and especially if they're little boys, but my grandfather Lee was frequently away from the home. <laughs> he was not a very good manager of money. I'm sure you will understand if we don't speak on that again. And he was frequently away from the home. He was not there for the arrival of Papa. And so my grandmother named him Robert Edward Lee after her two favorite brothers. And there at Stratford, Papa grew to the very old age of four when the family did away to a new home in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, when I was a little girl at Arlington, well, all of us, really, well, Papa loved to tell us stories, particularly about when he was a little boy. And he would tell us these stories so we would be good little boys and girls. I'm sure your parents did the same. And I remember so well him telling us this, oh, we would sit at his feet and pull off his boots and we'd tickle his feet while he'd tell us stories. <laughs> he loved for us to tickle his feet. And sometimes we would get so involved in the story we'd forget. And he would stop and say, no tickle, no story. And we leave children would resume our duty. <laughs> but I remember him telling us the story of the day he left Stratford for the very last time. And of course, leaving the only home you'd ever known, even if you were but four years old, you'd remember such a day. But he also remembered it because it was the only day he ever disobeyed his mother. She had left him by the carriage to go back in the house to retrieve a few last minute items. You know how moving days are. And she told him to stay very still by the carriage until she returned. But he was fearful that leaving the only home he'd ever known, he wouldn't see his two dearest friends ever again. So as soon as she went back in the house, well, he went back in behind her to bid them farewell. And as soon as she returned to the carriage, of course, she knew immediately where to go looking. Mothers always know where our hiding places are. And she found him in the first place she looked. He was in the nursery. The little room there by the mother's room had been the only bedroom he'd ever known. And he was kneeling in front of the fireplace, just a wee little fireplace, bidding his friends farewell. But now you're probably thinking, what friends have you living in a fireplace? And they were the cherubs on the back of the fire dogs. They'd been his guardian angels all of his life. And very obediently, after bidding them farewell, he went back to the carriage with his mother and they did away to Alexandria. And there Papa did grow to young manhood, continuing his studies at what? Well, he was the man of the house by the time he was 12 years old. My grandfather having taken himself to the West Indies at that time for his health. I, I have heard there might have been other reasons involved. Uh, but now, 12 years old now, he was the head of the house. Well, he was the keeper of the keys. Now that means that Papa was in charge of the pantry. You see, every morning he would come downstairs and unlock the pantry door, and he would take inventory, and if anything was required for the day's victuals, well, Papa took the monies and baskets to the market, and retrieving those items required, he placed everything just so, and then he would leave for his tutor's home. Well, you see, considering that money was often in short supply in the Lee family home, my grandmother was in hopes Papa would receive his higher education at the expense of the federal government. <laughs> And Papa was preparing for entrance examinations to the United States Military Academy at West Point. He was going to be a soldier just like his own Papa had been. And so she kept a weekly report of his progress with his teachers. But she need not have worried. Of course, she was concerned that her money was not being wasted. But they all assured her of Papa's success. Even his mathematics instructor said that young Robert is a great one for finishing up. It's a shame to erase his conic section from the slate board before the next problem can be applied there. And in the afternoons, Papa would come home to the house there on a rock in those street, and he would go upstairs and scoop his mother up in his strong arms and carry her down to the waiting carriage. 
and placing her just so they would then ride through the streets of Alexandria for her exercise and she could bid a good day to friends and relations that she saw there. If it was a windy day, Papa would put newspapers in the cracks of the carriage so she would not take a chill. And he told her if she didn't smile, the exercise would do her no good at all. But I know she smiled. For her time now was growing very short with her handsome son. You see, he had received his appointment to West Point from none other than John C. Calhoun himself, the state's right senator from South Carolina. And as he prepared to leave her to go all the way to New York State, she told all who would listen, whatever shall I do without young Robert? He's both son and daughter to me. She was so very proud, and well, she should have been. Papa graduated from West Point in the class of 18 and 29. He was number two in the academic standing, a very distinguished class it was. And I might add that very few people ever remember who graduated number one. But they had to do their sums at the end of each term to de decide which cadet was actually in the number one position. So diligently did all of these boys work in their studies. The Papa graduated number two in the academic standing. He graduated at the, the highest rank of any of the cadets in the military order. Everybody had to salute Papa. And he graduated the only cadet that still had money left in his account. Now I know he learned that frugality from his mother. He certainly didn't learn it from his Papa. But more importantly than even all of that, Papa graduated without a single demerit to his record. And if you know anything at all about West Point, you get a demerit if your shoes aren't Papa's properly. But Papa didn't get a single demerit to his record. They called him the Marble Model. Now my big brother Cussis graduated number one in his class from West Point, but he had 13 demerits to his record. Oh, and Papa loved to bring those demerits up at the most inopportune time. When he was now president of the college there in Lexington, and Custis was a professor at Virginia Military Institute just down the way. We'd have dignitaries from all over the world come to Lexington and see Papa. And we'd be seated around the big dining room table there in the president's house at the college. And there would be Papa and the dignitaries and Brother Custis. And Papa would find some way to bring up those demerits just to embarrass his son Custis. Oh, we would all laugh. But now when he returned home, it was to a sad time. His mother was in her last illness. And Papa nursed her through that last illness. He was holding her hand when she breathed her last on the third. And although it was a sad time for Papa, it was an exciting time to be a second lieutenant in the Army Corps of Engineers. Well, that's the most elite part of the Army, I'm here to tell you. And he had received his first post to go down to Savannah, Georgia, such a lovely city, Savannah. And there he was to finish draining Coxford Island so they could start building Fortress Pulaski out there at the mouth of the Savannah River. Oh, and he would tell us stories about being out in the muck and mire all the way up to his armpits. I can't imagine Papa such a nasty place. But he loved Savannah and he made many fine friends there. For a lifetime he did. And particularly among the children. Papa just loved children. And children just loved Papa. And he would draw them pictures of the things he saw out in that swamp. Little terrapin turtles and even alligators he saw. But his heart was still in Virginia. Papa's heart was always in Virginia. And he had decided it was time for a wife and family of his own. He had already selected the bride, but she did not yet know it. <laughs> when he was just a little boy there in Alexandria, there beside the federal city, that's what we call Washington, D.C. in those days, he could look across the Potomac up on Arlington Heights to the beautiful mansion built by none other than the child of Mount Vernon, George Washington, part of Custis, the grandson of Martha Washington and the adopted heir of General George Washington. Well, everyone in the federal city called him Old Man Custis. You see, he hadn't missed a single inauguration of a president from his own grandpapa all the way down to President Buchanan. He had General Washington's field tent from the Revolution. And every Independence Day, we would put up that large tent, and that's where we'd all sit to watch the fireworks and the celebrations. I didn't know you could have Independence Day without my grandpapa, Gus. And he and his lovely wife, Mary Fitzhugh, another fine Virginia family had several children, but none of them survived infancy, save one. She was a little girl, they named her Mariana Randolph Custis. And she and Papa were of an age. And Papa would ask permission from his mother if he could cross over on the ferry and go up Arlington Heights where he and little Mariana would play together. And they became dear, dear friends. When he went away to West Point, he continued to write to her very clandestinely, of course. But now he was a second lieutenant in the Army Corps of Engineers. He came home to court her to be his wife. 
And when he presented himself there on the portico of that lovely mansion, his mother was swept off her feet. But he was just the handsomest thing she'd ever laid her eyes on. I wish she could have seen him. Dark hair curling down over his collar. And dark eyes almost black. Oh, he was so handsome. Everybody in the army agreed he was the handsomest thing they ever put on a uniform. And my grandmother, Custis, was swept off her feet. But you know how the papas can be about their little girls. <laughs> but of course, they can't tell them no for very long, so they started courting. And Mother herself told me on the day Papa proposed, the sweetest story, you've got to hear it. Well, they were at the Fitzhugh family plantation at Chatham on the banks of the Rappahannock River near Fredericksburg. And Papa was reading while my mother and grandmother did some of their needlework. Been reading for about three hours from Sir Walter Scott's novel, Ivanhoe, a wonderful story about chivalry and youth. Been reading about three hours, and my grandmother said, Mary, I believe young Robert can use a piece of carrot cake and a glass of lemonade from the kitchen. So being a dutiful daughter, my mother got up to retrieve those items, and Papa, being a perfect gentleman, of course, went along to assist. Now, my mother is a dear, dear soul. I love her very much, you understand, but she's quite clean. And when she prepared that piece of cake, she dropped the fork on the flagstones. And when she knelt down to pick it up, Papa knelt beside her and proposed. Isn't that the sweetest story you ever heard? Well, she said yes right there in the kitchen. And they dashed back to the parlor. Her mother gave her permission. All that was left was to win the old man over. Well, I don't have to tell you they got married. <laughs> At Arlington House on June the 30th, 1831. In an evening ceremony in the, the beautiful arch, under the beautiful archway between the dining room and the parlor. With a, filled that archway with lovely flowers from the Arlington Gardens. Oh, and the house was full to overflowing. There were leaves and custises and Fitzhughes and Carters. Well, they came from every corner of Virginia. We're related to everybody. The last to arrive was the minister, who in my experience is frequently the last to arrive. But as the dear soul came up the carriageway, the heavens just opened and the rain fell in buckets. What a dry bread only when he came in the house. Now, Grandpa Custis is a kind and generous man. He invited him back to his dressing room for some dry items of clothing to get through the ceremony. But Papa said when they emerged it was all they could do to hide their snickers. You see, my grandpapa Custis is very short and very round. <laughs> and the minister's very tall and very thin and the pants were too short and the seams were too short. Papa said they all pretended not to notice. And the rest of the ceremony went off without further ado. Except when Papa said that all the men folk were looking at him as if they were about to read his funeral rites instead of his wedding vows. But after a lovely journey to friends and relations who could not attend, they arrived at their first post together as husband and wife at Fortress Monroe, there at the mouth of the James River, near Norfolk, Old Point Comfort, they called it. And there, their family began to grow. Now there'd be seven of us all told. And we all lived to adulthood. Six of us were born back at Arlington, but the eldest was born there at Fortress Monroe. After that, Mother said there was a time when a woman just needed to be with her mama. <laughs> but there was my brother born at Fortress Monroe, and Papa very wisely named him George Washington Custis Lee. Well, the name was longer than the baby was. But Papa knew if he named that first arrival after his father-in-law, that was finished softening the old man up. <laughs> and it did do that, Grandpapa Custis, that brother Custis, so very much. But Papa knew that was too long a name for a little boy. So he began right then of giving all of his children their little family names, their little pet names. Now we don't know where Papa found all his names. But the name he gave Brother Custis was Boo. And do you know to this very day, if there's something I need for my Brother Custis, I'll sit down on the set he real close and I'll say, Boo, would you please help me? And he can never tell me no. But the next child born was a little girl. And Papa named for Mary Custis Lee. And the confusion began immediately. You see, my grandmother's name was Mary. My mother's name was Mary. Now my sister's name is Mary. And Papa saw the doll, he just called her daughter. And to this day, we call my sister Mary daughter. <laughs> when we can find her to call her anything. Well, you see, she is never at home. She's always dashing hither and yon. We don't know when we're going to receive a letter. We don't know if she's safe. She is so stubborn and so hard-headed. Indeed she is. Now, that's a terrible thing to say about your sister. But you may have not met her. And I know why she's so stubborn and so hard-headed. 
But you see, the government sent Papa out to St. Louis, Missouri to move the Mississippi River. <laughs> Did you not know? My Papa moved the Mississippi River. I have friends in St. Louis telling me that river's where he put it to this day. If the government hadn't ended the funding, he'd have moved it further. They'd never have to worry about that pretty city out there flooding. But when he went, he took Mother and the two boys, and they left my sister Mary with the grandparents. Well, you know how grandparents are with the babies. She just pulled through and through. She has not yet married. I don't think she ever will. I don't think there's a man that'll have her. <laughs> but I know that's a terrible thing to say. But that, uh, Papa was superintendent at West Point. <laughs> uh, Brother Katsis was a cadet there at that time. And he had a dear friend, you probably have heard of him, his name was James Ewell Brown Stewart. Most people just called him Jeb, I called him Brother Jeb. <laughs> he was Custis' dear friend and he came every Sunday to luncheon at the superintendent's house. And he was courting my sister Mary, I know he was because I was eavesdropping at the parlor door. <laughs> but he went on to marry Miss Flora Cook and he told an acquaintance that he had courted the young Miss Lee but he'd escaped unscathed. <laughs> If you knew my sister Mary the way I do, you'd understand what General Stewart was speaking of. But we do love her. She's just so hard. Now the next child born was another boy. A papa named him William Henry Fitzhugh Lee. Well, that's another very large name, but this one fits. Papa called him Rooney. That's the Irish word for darling. Rooney darling. Well over six feet tall, with large hands and large feet, and a heart to match. You won't find a kind of gentler soul if you look the whole world over. But he is a big man. An acquaintance of his at Harvard College said, yes, he knew Mr. Lee, found him too large to be a man, but too small to be a horse. <laughs> now the next two were born two years apart, but they were so close in spirit, many thought they were twins. My sister Agnes and my sister Annie. Now Papa called Agnes Wiggs a wiggy and we truly don't know where he found that name. She was the real beauty of the family. She got Papa's eyes. I got Papa's nose. Looked fine on Papa's face. It's far too large for mine. And he called Annie. That's the one he named after his mother. Sweet Annie or sometimes Raspberry. She had a little birthmark on her cheek. She was the first to leave us. It was October of 1862. And we were scattered by that awful war. She was taken ill in Warrington, North Carolina. Agnes and Mother were with her. And I received that letter. I was in school in North Carolina in Raleigh. And I received that letter saying that sweet spirit had slipped the bonds of this earth. And I was so worried about Papa. He loved her so. He loved all of us. But I knew there was something special about him. We did not know that our circle would be broken so soon. Um, then the next child was another boy. Papa named him Robert Edward Lee Jr., my big brother Rob. As a young man, he had a reoccurring fever, and Papa changed his name to Roberta Sickett, so he was fluent in Latin. And then, in 1846, on February the 10th, I was born. And Papa named me Mildred. Mildred Child, Mildred after his sister Mildred, who had married Mr. Child and lived in Paris. But now, 1846, that was a very important year. That was the year of that great war with Mexico. And Papa had been in the Army a long time, still just a captain. Because in the peacetime Army, they just don't promote you very often. Even if you do build forts after forts after forts. So it was Fort Monroe, and Fort Pulaski, and Fort Hamilton, Fort Carroll. Well, you understand. But General Winfield Scott, another fine Virginian, asked for Papa to be on his personal staff as his engineer. And then later, Papa was his chief of staff. So he left us in 1846. I was just a little thing in a cradle, did not yet have my special name. And Papa left us to go all the way to the war in Mexico. Now I know Mother must have worried years off of her existence. Oh, Papa wrote to us. He wrote very frequently. He wrote to the children individually, of course I was too small, I couldn't read, but he wrote to Custis and to Rooney and all of us, but he read to Mama, but he would never tell her the dangers he was in. But my mother had friends in the war department, and they told her the most amazing thing, how Papa was mentioned in every report General Scott sent back to the war department. He called him the finest soldier he had ever seen in the field. 
He called him the indefatigable Lee. And I'm not sure what that means, but I think it means Papa never got tired. All the most amazing things. And Papa was promoted in every battle in which he fought. He left as a captain, came home a colonel. Oh, and the day Papa came home. Now, I was but two. But you'll understand this will be the most important day of my life up to that time. The day Papa came home. So they told me the story so many times, I just know I remember it. Papa was arriving by train, and Mother was to send a carriage down to the Alexandria train station to retrieve him. But my mother's never been on time for an event in her life. Papa's the only man I ever knew to make a train arrive on time. She was late and he was early. He had to lease himself a horse to come home and see his family. And when he arrived at the carriageway there at Arlington, no one recognized him except our dog, Speck. But I'll tell you, my Papa and that dog were very, very close. Speck went with us everywhere. You see, Papa had found his mother in the harbor of New York when we were there building Fortress Hamilton. And she had a litter of puppies. And Speck was the only one that we kept. Little white dog, little black Specks on, hence the name. And he went with us everywhere. He even went with us to church. And I remember one Sunday when we arrived at Christ Church there in Alexandria. It was a very cold, cold, blustery day. And I was so afraid he'd get cold sitting outside the church. Didn't have hardly any hair on him at all. And I let him get up under my skirt and come to the church with us. <laughs> I didn't see what harm could come of it. We had one of those pews that had the little door on it. But I didn't know he was going to sit there and bark through the whole service. <laughs> Papa was mortified. He said Speck could never come to church with us again. So the very next Sunday, we assembled there at the carriage. And Papa scooped him up and took him upstairs to one of the bedrooms and locked the door. We got in the carriage and we did away to the to the ferry, but now that dog was very resourceful. Someone had left the window open, but it wasn't me. He jumped out of that window and down onto the lawn, and he must have been a good swimmer. When we got to the church, he was sitting on the steps waiting for us. <laughs> Papa said that Sunday, if Speck wanted to come to the Lord's house that badly, he was not the man to stand in his way. And he could ride in the carriage, but he could never come back in the church again under my skirts. Papa would make me lift my hand and see if there was a little puppy dog tail down there. It, of course, when he came in the house, Mother recognized him. Although he had changed, more handsome than ever, she said. He had a little gray in at the temples. He'd grown a mustache. And he, uh, he embraced the little children. And he uh, shook hands with Brother Custis, who had outgrown the age of embracing. You know how boys are. But he turned to Mother and he said, where's the baby? Hadn't seen me since I was just a little thing in the crack. And I was running about as only a rambunctious two-year-old can do. And he stopped me and scooped me up in his arms and held me tight. And he said, this is the most precious bundle of life I have ever seen. And from that time on to my papa, that was my name. Life. A precious life. He said, as long as I was in the house, he didn't need sunshine. He would start his letters to me, dear precious life. And I ended my letters to him, all my love, your precious life. And I loved to write to Papa. He was always going hither and yon wherever the army sent him. And I loved to write to him or if I happened to be away. He said it took a family committee meeting to decipher my letters. Apparently my handwriting was atrocious. I believe that was Mother's word, not his. But I loved to write to him. And I would tell him all of the stories about my pet cat. I had loved to have pet cats at Arlington. I named them all Tom. <laughs> but I thought that would keep down on the confusion. We just called Tom and all the cats come running. And I love to write to him. I remember a letter Papa wrote to me when he was in Texas. And he, he said, Dear Precious Life, it's a, my pet snake has recently passed away after refusing his daily meal of frogs. In your next letter, if you would kindly send me one of your kittens, I would be most appreciative. <laughs> well, I tried. I truly did. That cat didn't want to go to Texas. Couldn't get an envelope big enough. He just would, did, didn't want to go down to hot Texas. Couldn't send Papa one of my kittens. But you know, during that awful unpleasantness, it was very hard for us to have a pet cat in Richmond, a pet of any kind. And one morning as I left our house on Franklin Street, I was walking uh, down the street and I found a little baby squirrel. And he seemed friendly enough. And I thought, what a wonderful pet for the Lee family. That's our family mammal, you understand. Our motto is not unmindful of the future. Hence the squirrel. Always gathering his nuts for the winter, thinking ahead. And I, I scooped up this little squirrel. He seemed perfectly content. I brought him home with us. Well, I went upstairs to Brother Custis's room. I knew he hadn't yet left for his uh, office at the water park. And I knocked on the door and I said, Boo, would you please come help me? Well, of course, he couldn't tell me no. And we found a little bird cage that no longer had an occupant. And we turned it into a home for my little pet squirrel. 
and put him in the parlor. And I named him Custis Morgan. Custis after Brother Custis, of course, and Morgan after John Hunt Morgan, the Confederate partisan ranger, escaped from that nasty Yankee prison up in Ohio. I named him that because he was all the time escaping from our little prison in the parlor. <laughs> and I would write to Papa all the antics of Custis Morgan as if that would take his mind off of that awful war. But I remember so well. Now he was fearful that being a wild thing he might bite my mother, who was now confined to a rolling chair. I didn't tell him the squirrel had already bitten mother's doctor twice. But he wrote to me, and I shall never forget, it was March of 1864, I still got the letter. And he said, Dear Precious Life, if the next time you give Custis Morgan his bath, if you'll hold his head under the water for an extra 10 minutes, it'll solve all of your problems. <laughs> Can you imagine Papa telling me to drown that squirrel? <laughs> but of course I did not do it. But I think Custis Morgan read Papa's letter. He disappeared two weeks later. We never saw that squirrel again. I had a friend of mine declare he was a Yankee spy. <laughs> taking his information back to the Union Army, but I am here to declare that the, that the Lee family would not have harbored a Union spy in the very parlor of our home. I think he read Papa's letter. He left while he could. But of course, it was wonderful to have Papa home. Oh, how wonderful to have him home from being gone so long. And he would, oh, he would wake us up in the morning, tickling us until we screamed for him to stop. He was teaching the boys how to ride their horses and jump over obstacles he would place in the lawns there at Arlington, teaching Mary how to ride her horse side saddle. And so elegant. Oh, I wish you could have seen Papa on horseback. Such an excellent horseman. And he would tell us stories about Mexico while we tickled his feet. And he would, oh, he taught us so many words in Spanish. He had learned a great deal of Spanish. In fact, in 1848, when he returned home, he told the War Department there would come a time when every American would need to speak Spanish. I can't imagine that time coming, but perhaps you can. <laughs> oh, but my favorite game to play with Papa, whenever he was home from wherever the Army sent, was a game he called strategy. Now he would take each one of us children into a different room in Arlington House. And he would tell us to sit very still and be very quiet until our papa came back to get us. Because if we weren't very still and very quiet until our papa came back to get us, while the Indians would get us. Friends, I would sit there sometimes now three quarters of an hour, still as a mouse. That's very hard for a little girl. I was a young woman before I realized that was papa's way of having time alone with my mother. <laughs> And six to seven children all wanting time with their papa. Well, they didn't even have time for a cup of tea. <laughs> Wasn't long after he returned that he was appointed to superintendent there at West Point. And we all moved up to the superintendent's house there at West Point. How wonderful Custis was a cadet there. Jeb Stewart and Cousin Fitzhugh, Uncle C.D. Smith's boy, Papa's nephew. And I, <laughs> there was Cousin Fitzhugh. Papa didn't know what a demerit was, because he never got one. Cousin Fitz, you had enough for the whole cadet corps. <laughs> Papa was afraid he'd have to dismiss his own nephew from the point. But he marched them all off and graduated with his class. And that's when the Army sent Papa out to Texas, the second United States Cavalry. Huh? Dry nasty Texas. I remember <laughs> Agnes and Annie were in school in Stanton, Virginia at the time, at the girls' seminary there, and it was a particularly hot year even in the hills, and uh, Agnes really wanted to come home. And she, and she and Annie really wanted to come home. She wrote to Papa in Texas and she said, it's so very hot up here in the hills. I'm sure it would be cooler on the banks of the Potomac. Can I please go home and help tend to mother? Well, Papa saw right through that. And he was very insistent on our education. He simply told her, dear Wiggy, if it's too hot for you in Virginia, you just come on down here to Texas. It's the noon hour, the candlestick is melting, the candle is melting in the candlestick. It's 110 degrees in my tent. You just come on down here to Texas, take care of your papa. But she decided to stay in school in Stanton. Apparently, it wasn't as hot as she thought it was. <clears throat> it was 1857. A very sad time came to our family. Grandpapa Custis passed away. And he named Papa the executor of his estate. And Papa took a year's leave of absence from the army to come home and find his 
father-in-law being no better manager of money than his own papa had been. And one year turned to two. Now, of course, Arlington was not left to papa. Grandpa Custis left my father, General Washington's sword, that he had carried in the Revolution. Papa kept it in an umbrella stand by his bed. Arlington, of course, went to mother and then Custis after him. But Papa was there to see to it that the will was executed as Grandpapa Custis would have wanted. And so it was in 1859. I was seated on the front steps there of the portico of Arlington House with all the toms around me. And I saw a great cloud of dust come up the carriageway and there before me, as if he and the animal was one, was Lieutenant Jeff Stewart, just starting to grow that beard we all remember so well. And he came down off that horse and he bowed to me as only Jeff Stewart could do. I wish you could have seen him. And he dashed in the house. Well, before I knew what had transpired, Papa came around uh, out on the por portico in his civilian clothes I always remember because he was so handsome in his uniform. And he put on his top hat and one of our people brought his horse round and he kissed me on the cheek and said he would be back as soon as he could and he was gone. Well, I went in the house and said, Mother, where's Papa off to? And you know she said that there was an emergency in a little town in western Virginia. And the army had sent Papa out to take care of it. And that he would return as soon as he could. Well, as she said this was a little town. I said the name of it was Harper's Ferry. I shall never forget it. I understand it's in a state now named West Virginia. <laughs> Apparently it was permissible during the unpleasantness for the western counties of Virginia to secede from Virginia, but it was not permissible for Virginia to secede from the Union. So we'll have to have another meeting to discuss that. <laughs> but I kept watch by the clock, you understand. Papa was home within 36 hours. And I said, Papa, what's happened? And he said, Precious life, you pay it no mind. Your Papa's taking care of everything. Will you imagine him telling me to pay it no mind? That's when that madman John Brown took over that whole little town of Harper's Ferry. Tried to overthrow the Commonwealth of Virginia. They hanged him for treason, they did. Papa telling me to pay it no mind. Well, our troubles were just beginning. 1860, Papa went back to Texas. Oh, that was that year of that awful presidential election. I do hope we don't have another one like that. Well, there were four men running for president, and not a single state in all the Union had all four men on the same ballot. There was Mr. Lincoln from Illinois, and Mr. Douglas from Illinois, and Mr. Breckenridge from Kentucky, and Mr. Bell from Tennessee. Well, of course, we women folk couldn't vote, but my mother was an ardent follower of the news of the day, and Papa would write to us and share with us his opinions as well. And I knew he was going to vote for Mr. Bell. You see, South Carolina threatened to secede if Mr. Lincoln was elected. And Papa knew secession wasn't the answer to our trouble. But you probably are aware Mr. Lincoln was elected. And South Carolina did secede just prior to the holy days of 1860. After the first of the year, six more states seceded. The deep South states, cotton states we call them. Uh, Texas and Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana and Georgia and Florida. But that North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, those were all remembered as Confederate states. Virginia had not yet determined her course. But as young as I was, I knew. As Virginia decided, so would Robert Lee. For you see, he loved Virginia above everything else on this earth, saving his God and his family. His mother had raised him that way. And indeed, when Mr. Lincoln called uh, after the uh, Fort, Fort Sumter and Charleston Harbor was fired upon. Mr. Lincoln called for volunteers for an army to put down the rebellion. And General Winfield Scott, a dear friend of our family, is now the, the uh, chief of staff for Mr. Lincoln, sent to Texas for Papa to come home. And he was offered the position of Brigadier General and the command of that army to put down that rebellion. Such was General Scott's confidence in my father. But Papa knew he couldn't lead that army. He knew that army would march through Virginia. And Papa knew what would happen if an army invaded Virginia, even if it was bound for South Carolina. And he knew he could not raise his sword against his own state. His boys owning property there, his brother, all his cousins, his family. 
and he wrote a letter to General Scott that said, in defense of my home state, I hope never again to draw my sword. And Papa resigned a 30-year Army career, thinking he could come home to Arlington and simply be a farmer. But it was not, of course, to be. If you have ever seen Arlington, if you've ever been to the federal city, or you've seen Arlington, beautiful house overlooking the Potomac River. And Papa knew enough of military matters to know what a strategic point that was. The Sunday after Virginia seceded, three men met Papa as we came out of church at St. Christ Church in Alexandria. Governor Lecter required his presence in Richmond, and Papa left Arlington never to return. In the days following, General Scott informed my mother that there would be um, an occupation of Arlington House. And we began to sort through things, sent to friends and family, many things left in the cellar, and we became without a home. And so it begins. Now you know my family's service in that war. Papa was commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. Brother Custis was an advisor to President Davis, later to have a field command. Rooney was a cavalry officer with General Stewart. And my brother Rob was an artillerist in the Rockbridge Artillery. I even served for a time as a nurse after the Battle of All's Love. We could hear the guns from all. But of course, Papa insisted I return to Miss Powell's Academy. He said, it just wasn't fitting for me to see such things. And I returned to Winchester, Virginia, to Miss Powell's school. Now, that's the very heart of the Shenandoah Valley. There were so many armies in and out of that little town, they didn't know what flag to fly from the courthouse. But Papa knew Precious Life would be perfectly safe as long as there was a general in the valley by the name of Stonewall. When General Jackson was called to Richmond for the Seven Days Campaign in 1862, Papa moved me to St. Mary's Academy in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I stayed there until 1863. I told him I learned everything I needed to know. Could I please come back to Richmond to help take care of Mother? And so, friends, it was I was in Richmond when the city failed. It was a Sunday. It was April the 2nd. I was in church at St. Paul's Episcopal there at Capitol Square. Our family pew here. The minister stopped speaking in the middle of his sermon. Very unusual for him. I turned to look. Mr. Davis being just behind me to my right and saw a messenger deliver a telegram. I knew immediately it was from Papa. But Mr. Davis got up very quickly. He and the cabinet members in attendance and they left. After the service, when I returned home and I told Mother what I'd seen, she correctly surmised that Papa had abandoned his position at Petersburg. The end was upon us. We watched that afternoon as the boys in gray left our city. I hope you never see such a sight. I do hope you never see such a sight. With them went the last vestiges of law and order. Oh, we did not fear for a harm to ourselves. No one would have harmed the general's family. But we feared for the harm to the good people of Richmond who were so destitute of even the very basic things of life by that point. We watched out our back windows. We could see the south bank of the James where the warehouses by the rail yards were as the boys in gray set them alight. You see, the rail lines had all been cut. We didn't want the Yankees to get everything. And as we watched those flames catch and burn on those warehouses, we feared for the entire city of Richmond that it would burn to ash. On Monday morning, the boys in blue came to take their place. Equally as frightening. We were assembled in the parlor when we heard a great pounding on our door. My mother sent Sister Mary, who thankfully was at home. I don't think I, my, my knees could have withstood it. Mary went to the door and there stood a Yankee officer and two of his soldiers. They came into the parlor and they bowed very gallantly to Mother. I didn't know the Yankees could be gallant. And he said, Mrs. Lee, we are here to take you and your daughters to safety. Please pack your things and come with me. My mother looked at this Yankee and said, I will not go. Now, I had heard my mother use that tone of voice before, but that Yankee had not. And he said again, Mrs. Lee, the city is no longer safe. We would like to take you and your daughters to safety. Please pack your things and come with me. My mother said a second time, I will not go. I'm starting to feel sorry for that Yankee. <laughs> but he tried gallantly again. He said, Mrs. Lee, you are not under arrest. We will take you wherever you wish to go. But 
that the city is no longer safe, the wind is against you, it's going to burn to the ground, let's leave, please get your things and come with me. My mother said a third time, I will not go. And this time, the Yankees surrendered to my mother. But he left those two soldiers on our front stoop, which I thought was, again, a very gallant gesture on his part. We watched out the back windows as the sparks did indeed cross the James River and the north bank of Richmond began to burn. Mother said Sister Mary out on the front stoop with a bucket of water. Now, I don't know what my mother thought my Sister Mary and a bucket of water could do against the flames of Richmond, but I will tell you that the house across the street from I was burned to the ground and not one spark struck our house. The flames of Richmond obey my mother when she uses that kind of voice. <laughs> Papa surrendered to General Grant on the 9th, the next Sunday. He returned to us on the 15th. Custis had already returned to Richmond, having given his parole. Rooney was with Papa, I could see out the window. We didn't know where Rob was, we feared he was dead. He showed up, he'd gone to North Carolina. We were all back assembled. But on that day that Papa returned to Richmond, the rains were pouring down and there was a great assembly there in the street, in Franklin Street. Most of the boys in blue to come and see the gym. And when Papa rode up on travel, that beautiful gray horse, oh, I declare they could talk to each other. I just wanted to run outside and throw my arms around but Mother said, no, it wouldn't be fit. So I watched from the window. You could not hear a sound with the father of the rain. Papa got off traveler, came in to the stoop, took his hat off, and bowed to all those assembled, and he came into the bosom of his family. He was so very tired. Every day, the crowds would come back hoping to get a glimpse of the general. Papa didn't want to be seen. You should have been there that day Mr. Brady came with that photography equipment. <laughs> Said he wanted to take Papa's photograph. He had gone to another lady of Richmond who had spoken to Mother and Mother nagged him so he'd do it. He didn't want that photograph taken. If you ever see it, you look at his eyes, you can tell. <laughs> but of course, those pictures are such a comfort to me now that I have those photographs of Papa. And cuss it and walk the table. But it was in the evenings when the crowds would disperse. Papa would come downstairs and he would put on his great coat and I would put on my cloak and we would walk through the streets of Richmond. Oh, it was so very sad. Papa didn't talk much. That was fine by me. I was just so glad to have him home. He did go out for a public haircut. That was the one public appearance, if you will. And while he was seated in the barber's chair, the little children of Richmond were pressed up against the glass watching. And when he settled his accounts and left, they rushed in and started picking up the scraps of Papa's hair. He came home and he said, Precious, I don't understand why they'd do such a thing. And friends, he sincerely did not. But I did. That was the last public hair that Papa ever got. Agnes Rob one cut his hair in the parlor from that time on, but we'd saved the clippings. And for years, we received letters from all over this country, north, south, west, of people announcing the birth of a new Robert Edward Lee and the name of a proud papa. Could they have a memento with a rock of hair and an envelope papa never know. Old soldiers would come by, wanting to see their general one last time. We were almost relieved when Judge Brockville arrived and said that Papa had been elected president of Washington College. Papa didn't even know he'd been nominated. A little Presbyterian school, we are Episcopal. Little Presbyterian school out in Lexington, Virginia. Only 90 boys returning. Judge Brock Brewer told him it was his duty to come rebuild the South. And so we went to Lexington. 90 boys returning when Papa passed away last year. There were over 400 and he could call every one of them by name. When you arrived at the campus, you received one visit with the president in his study. You did hope it was your last. Papa told each of the boys, you will conduct yourself as a gentleman. That's the only rule we have here. Conduct yourself as a gentleman. You know right from wrong. Do you not? 
and he kept a weekly report of their academic progress, just as his mother had. And if it was not what Papa deemed appropriate, well, you were invited back for another meeting with the president. And he would remind them of the sacrifices being made by their parents, many of them widowed mothers, you understand. For them to be there, that's all it would take. He loved the little village of Lexington. My sisters and I must confess, found it to be rather boring after, Ri after Richmond, but we did, a, um, we established a reading circle. <laughs> Papa said he thought we just met to gossip and drink tea, but we did read a few books. Papa would come home early from his office frequently and, and come through the, uh, the rose garden wherever there was Mary Lee, Robert Lee planted roses. And he would pick a rosebud for each of the ladies in attendance of the reading circle, and he would go in the kitchen and put a tea cozy on his head. Now, I don't know if you know what a tea cozy is for, but it does not go on your head. It goes on your teapot. But he'd put it on his head and he would dance into the parlor and distribute his roses and dance back out again to mother's mortification and my delight. Doesn't sound very much like a general, does it? But that was my papa. He had left the war behind, you see. Didn't like to talk about it. He preferred the company of women and children to the men folk who wanted to talk about what if, what if. You see, he had left the war behind him. And so, Papa, in the afternoons, you could set your pocket watch fine. He would come home for luncheon and he would uh, sit in his chair and Agnes would, would rub his arm. His left arm pained him a great deal. And I would play the piano. Then he would get on travel and he would go for a long ride in the hills around Lexington. One day he came home and he was very sad. And I said, Papa, what's wrong? And he said, Precious Life, I met a lady today. You know the widow. And he called her by name. I said, yes, sir. And he said, she's so very sad. She met me at the end of her carriageway today. And I could tell she was angry. But there beside of her carriageway was a large oak tree ancient oak tree that I knew had been so damaged by Dave Hunter's artillery that the tree was quite dead. And she stopped me and I took my hat off to greet her and she said, General Lee, what should I do about this tree? I said, Papa, what did you tell her? He said, Precious Life, I told her to cut it down. And I wrote on. You have been a most delightful audience this evening. I want to leave you with my favorite memory of Papa his dearest friend in all of Lexington town. No, I think I'll tell you another one. He came to, up for luncheon one day and he had that beautiful grin on his face. He designed the president's house with a large veranda so uh, mother could go out on a rolling chair. And I would always stand on the veranda and wait for him to come up for his luncheon. And, and he had that beautiful grin on his face and turned to a smile and then he started laughing. I said, Papa, what's so funny? He said, there's been an attempted murder at the campus. Well, I said, I didn't think murder was very funny. And it seems that morning when he arrived at his office door, he and Custis had also designed an ecumenical chapel. Uh, that's where Papa's buried today. Um, and his office was downstairs in the chapel and there was a devotion every morning. It wasn't required, but all the boys knew Papa would be there, so of course they came. He sat on the first pew to the right as the minister looked out and, and each of the ministers in town took it in turns. The Baptist and Presbyterian and Matthew, you understand. And just for a devotion and Papa was always there. Well that morning when he arrived at his office door before the devotion, there stood a very agitated faculty member declaring someone had tried to kill him. Well, Papa asked to hear the story, and it seems that morning when he put a stick of wood on the wood fire to knock the chill from the room, it exploded with a great smell of gunpowder. Somebody tried to kill him. Well, after the minister concluded his remarks, Papa stood and announced to the assembly there had been an attempted murder. Anyone having information, please meet the president in his study. When he arrived downstairs, there stood two very frightened boys. I think they were from Tennessee. And they explained that someone was stealing wood from the student wood pile. And they surmised that they took a piece of wood and hollowed out a portion and put gunpowder in it and sealed it back over while the resultant explosion would reveal the mystery. And how were they to know it was the servant for the faculty that was stealing the wood? They didn't mean to hurt anybody. <laughs> Papa looked at him very seriously. He was using that general's voice. I know he was. And he said, gentlemen, your idea was a sound one. Next time, use less powder. <laughs> Some of their military lessons were not well translated to academia. 
But his dearest friend in all of Lexington town was a little nine-year-old boy named Carter Jones. Little Carter's papa was Dr. William Jones, who was the Baptist preacher. And every day when it was Dr. Jones' responsibility to bring the devotion, little Carter would come with his papa and he would sit with my papa. And he would sit there just as straight, look up at papa, make sure his shoulders were back, sit there just as still as a mouth, perfect gentleman. Just a perfect gentleman, still as a mouth. But on graduation day, he arrived with his mother. And he came in the back doors of the assembly, the dais being as your assembly room here is. And he looked for Papa in his accustomed place, but he was not there. At present, he was on the day. When the little Carter found Papa, he broke from his mother, ran to the front, climbed up on the stage, and not finding a chair for himself, he just sat down on the floor beside Papa and began to chatter away. His mother was devastated. So she dashed to the front to retrieve him, and Papa waved and said, No, don't be him be. Well, friends, I couldn't take my eyes off the little Carter. He sat there just like a little soldier, had his shoulders back and looked up at Papa, and he sat there just as still as a mouth, and that speaker went on and on, you know how they do, no one ever remembers a word they say, until his head started to nod, and his eyes got so heavy, and he laid his little head over Papa's knee and went down the street. Well, eventually the speaker concluded his remarks, whereupon the president was to rise and deliver the diploma. The Papa knew if he got up, he'd wake up little Carter. That year at Washington College, the diplomas were delivered by the president from a seated position, and little Carter slept through the entire affair. <laughs> you have indeed been a delightful audience. I hope you've enjoyed my memories of Papa. And if I can ever be of any assistance to you all, I hope you will. The ass. Good evening. I love coming here. I love coming here to Lenore. I can do it now without GPS. <laughs> I can find this place without GPS. So thank you so much for coming tonight. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Yes, I'm hot. Yes. <laughs> no, ma'am. None of the girls married. Mary wasn't. And Mary was the last to die. She out, just about outlived Moses. Um, you know, the main ones you got to shoot. Uh, she died in 1925. <laughs> she, Mildred died in 1905. Um, but uh, Mary did not marry precisely for that reason, and she lived the life of um, General Lee's daughter to the hilt. Um, Annie died in 62. Agnes passed away three years after Papa. She and Mother died within weeks, days of each other, just about hours of each other. Very sad. But she was never really well, and um, she had uh, angina. That's the only way thing that we can describe it. And so very, very sad. And her heart was utterly broken And uh, at the Christmas of 62 when the one that everybody assumed she would marry, his family, it was a cousin, you know how they did that back then. And his family lived in Maryland and they stayed loyal. And Orton went with the South and went out west. And he came home that Christmas and gave her a Bible. And she saw the hardness of war in him. And many people make a big deal that Lee had something to do with it. Lee was nowhere near them when this happened. Agnes made that decision solely on her own that this is that he's changed too much. And if she was using her father as a model, don't we all look to marry somebody like Papa? Um, I know I look for my daddy and the guys that, you know, that I do. And so she sent him away and within Three months, Orton was hanged as a spy. He was captured in a Union uniform and was hanged as a spy as opposed to being shot <laughs> as a, you know, a military justice. Um, and she, it broke her. It just broke her. She never got over it. That, that and then Annie's uh, death had come so close, October, and then this happened in December. And it just broke her. Um, uh, Mildred admitted in 18, uh, 1878, she uh, wrote a letter and she said, most women when they lose such a father have a husband and children to comfort them and I have nothing. So it may be that she regretted it. I know she had suitors the night that Lee collapsed. There was a young gentleman caller there. Um, and Lee's bedtime was 10. And at 10 till 10, if the young man was still there, he would walk into the parlor of the president's house and say good night. That's all he would say, good night. And then he would turn around and walk away. That was, that was a clue. 
If they were still there five minutes later, he came in and closed the shutters. That was not a good sign. <laughs> Very few pushed it to that. So I know she had suitors, but um, she she does say, I compared all men to him and he is greater to me than any hero. And all of them have pale in comparison. So at least she was honest with it. But she lived out her life uh, after uh, uh, Lee died, his son Custis, who was still a professor at VMI, they wanted to give the president's house to Mrs. Lee and she wouldn't take it because they designed it as the president's house for Washington College, which is now Washington and Lee University so far, at least up until today it still is. And uh, the president still lives there. And so uh, he just has to keep the garage open so you can see Traveler's stall. That's a rule. Um, and so uh, she wouldn't take it, so they named Custis president, so she would have a roof over her head. I don't think that would have been a problem for mother, <laughs> but she was by this time, I mean, the woman had, had been ill since the second child. I mean, she, rheumatoid arthritis is horrific. Um, so uh, Custis didn't really want to be president. But after um, mother and, and Agnes died, uh, Mildred stayed on and help, would help him open school and she would come back for commencement, uh, for graduation with all the parties and, and hostessing that had to be done. The rest of the time she stayed with uh, Robert and Rooney on the East Coast. They had, um, they had plantations. Uh, Rooney inherited the White House, which is where George and Martha Washington got married. Of course, it got burned in the war and he had to rebuild it, but it was still that plantation. And uh, Rob had Ramona Coke, um, and so she stayed with them. And she always called Rob's little girls for something to love. She traveled a great deal and she died in New Orleans. She had gone down there for a Confederate veterans meeting and sons of Confederate veterans. There was a moment when they overlapped when there were still enough veterans. And she had just said she loved New Orleans and she thought she could make a home there and she died that night in her hotel room. They found her the next morning. She had not even undressed. So the heart attack must have hit her very shortly after coming upstairs. She was 59. Yeah, that's <laughs> I don't know if my kids would agree with you on that, but I live to harass them. I mean, what is the next time. character you're working on right now? You're going to come back to that one, right? You know, funny you should ask that. I don't know if it's going to happen. I kind of told her I would, but I'm praying that God comes back between now and then. Uh, not because I don't want to do the character, it's just it's an awful lot of work. <laughs> it's like, man, uh, I mean, there are more, more women, I, they have more clothes than I do. That's what I'm saying. And somebody wrote on my, my wall, this, my birthday was Wednesday, and they said, happy birthday to you and all the people in your head. And I'm, I'm just not, that was, I'm not, I can't decide if that was a compliment or not. But um, a friend of mine who was uh, in the Daughters of the Colonies, do y'all have a chapter of that up here, Daughters of the Colony? Yeah. Uh, no, the A.R. Daughters of Revolution. This is before then. <laughs> God love them. But no, you you got to have somebody over here before Revolution to be in this group. Anyway, she uh, she wanted me to do another character, and, and we started bannering around. And maybe, maybe Abigail Adams. It's such a wonderful love story with Abigail and John. I mean, it, you know, just spicy as I'll get out. Man, I just I loved, loved her for years. But I just don't know if she's going to get in my head. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Lottie and Julia and Anna and Mildred are enough. And occasionally me. <laughs> if you've seen her do, if your baby's name, if you've seen her do Lottie Moon, uh, Christmas all the way his name is Barbara International Mission. Uh, she came to our church last year and his mom was there. And it's, it's just wonderful the way she brought it. Lottie's life is amazing. Uh, it really is. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful story of Lottie Mae's life. Well, I, I met. Um, I think she, uh, there's times I really would say that she did. When uh, I was 15, I met a reenactor at Appomattox who was doing first person, and in that wonderful romantic way that a 15 year old teenager would say, "I'm going to do that one day when I grow up." Well, I'm still waiting to grow up, but. When I got my own classroom, and there was always the people, I love Williamsburg, you know, that first person stuff they do. And it was always the people that intrigued me and the people's stories. You can look up a date. You know, I mean, as long as you've got some concept of chronology, a decade, you know, you can look up a date. 
to me it's the people that made these things happen and people are funny and they're sad and they have tragedies and they have they make mistakes and so I wanted to bring some people to life in my room and so I thought well maybe you know I I had that man's picture on my desk my entire career that man's picture was on my desk very faded but on my desk so um, I got to thinking I would do, couldn't do it general because that just wasn't plausible. <laughs> Wanted to, but not plausible. So uh, who who will I do? And of course Lee was. I've, I've been in love with him since I was. Well, I'm a good Southern girl. You can imagine how long I've been in love with him. So it's like I'll do Mrs. Lee. Well, no. <laughs> it, I'm just now coming to a full appreciation of Mother. She really was an amazing woman in her own right. And, and very much the source of his faith. Uh, he would give full credit for his faith and his God from the influence of his wife and his mother-in-law. So I have a better appreciation for mother now, but I don't know, maybe it was just it was jealousy. I don't know, maybe that was it. She married him and I didn't. Um, and Mary, I don't like Mary. Nobody likes Mary. <laughs> Jim Stewart ran. Jim Stewart runs from nothing. And he ran from Mary. So, and of course, Ag Annie died too early. I mean, she couldn't tell the whole story. Agnes was the pretty one, and I couldn't relate to her. So I started looking, you know, when I looked at Mildred, and I thought, it's very obvious she's Daddy's little girl. Well, so was I. She played the piano. I played the piano. She liked cats. I like cats. She had a weight problem. I have a weight problem. <laughs> I mean, just the list just continued to grow. And I just fell in love with her. And then when I went in Lee Chapel and met a docent there who told me about her mother's memories of Mildred. Could remember seeing her walk around and how much the village of Lexington loved her and how sweet she was. And I thought, well, I'm not sweet, but maybe I could act like it. <laughs> and so I, we chose each other. And she's been my twin sister since 1996. That was my first public performance. And... Um, I can't believe it's 21 years later and I'm still doing her. Um, and, and Jackson came along in 2001. And um, then um, Mrs. Grant came along in 2009. And then Lottie showed up in 2014. So who knows what will happen next year. <laughs> Thanks to Nora, who does so much for our Caldwell County Historical Society, and also for our Caldwell Heritage Museum, 112 Vaden Street, Lenore, North Carolina, 28645. We have an echo problem at our museum, and we are working on that to make our presentations better for you.